don't really have the time to sit there and send a personalized email to everyone. You know, a lot of people use MailChimp. Um, HubSpot's my personal favorite. They do have a free version of HubSpot that can kind of make things easier for you. And so, and if you don't have the automation, I know it seems kind of daunting to call all your customers, but at times like this, I think personalization and reaching out makes a difference. You know, people are kind of on edge and they're kind of nervous and you know, having that real life connection with the business is, is going to change a lot, especially with so many businesses sending out similar messages. You know, at the beginning of COVID, everyone was saying, you know, um, we're with you, we feel safe, we have your back. And you kind of saw it everywhere that you started to not believe it. So it's good when it's personalized and it's actually for that specific person and not just a general, general message. Um, so the next is communicate your business status. Um, this should be kind of one of those things that you think is very obvious, but um, how you do it and when you do it is really, really important um, because a lot of people just are doing the work compliant and we're open, but people are kind of looking for something a little bit more and we're going to go into more detail about that, but it's that we've got a deal. We have something for you specifically. Um, we have something that's going to make your life easier. We have a promotion. That's also super important to communicate because like I said, that we're open, we're compliant messaging is flooding the internet, it's flooding advertisements. So you wanna make sure that you're doing something to communicate that stands out and that your communication is clear. You know, you don't want companies to think, or sorry, clients to think that your hours are the same and go on Google and your Google My Business says we're open till nine and they show up at seven and you're closed. We don't want that to happen. So make sure everything's updated. Make sure you are saying that we're open, we're safe, but also make sure you're giving them a little bit more because people are kind of looking for that extra right now. Does anyone have any questions or comments um, at this point? Yeah, I do. <laughs> have you seen any really, because I agree, you know, that's, it's been so much communication. There does seem to be a lot of, um, you know, certainly consumer email coming out that, you know, isn't really helping me or telling me anything. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anybody who's done a really good job? Any, what are some great examples you'd hold up? Absolutely. I will go through some promotion, but one company that I think did it great, it was an ice cream shop in Winnipeg. And so people were not going out for ice cream. And so they're saying like, how are we supposed to communicate? What are we supposed to do? And what they did is they started sending out emails of people's flavors that they've purchased and saying, you could subscribe to get this delivered to your doorstep. And so it's, we're open. You can't come in, but we'll come to you and we'll drop it off. And so people are actually subscribing to get ice cream delivered to their home, which I don't know how I didn't think of that earlier. And that sounds ideal for everyone. So they really said, yeah, like how do we change this up? But also how do we communicate it? So it was personalized. You know, they said, we're not open right now. You can't come to us, but we do have something going on that. And then they kind of said like, how are we getting the ice cream? How are we making sure it's clean and safe? Who's delivering it? Are they wearing masks? Are they? So they really kind of said that we're not open, which I know seems kind of weird, but they were at least communicating that we are compliant and we've got a deal, which is ice cream at your doorstep. So, you know, it's Friday night and I want to cry to a rom-com. I have ice cream at my door. It works really, really great. So that's one, one really good example. Um, I'll kind of go through another one in a little bit, which is a hotel that did a, a good job kind of, kind of changing things up. Um, I, had a, I had a question. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I have a comment. You're the most relevant speaker I've sat on a Zoom call in a very long time. So thank you oh. because you're, no, I'm serious because okay. I've, I've, I've been on some Zoom calls and they're still talking about what happens when COVID hits. And uh, I love that you've pivoted. Um, I can't commend you enough. This is great. One question I have in particular is um, the time frame for all of this and I'm watching your slides and I see the, the, the march and you're watching the statistics of what was and what wasn't. Um, my question is specific where have you seen peaks and valleys and changes? So for example, you said phase one versus phase two, phase two versus phase mm -hmm. three. This is something that I'm really interested in because I personally, change my business, um, we put almost all of our money in R&D and marketing. That was mm -hmm. our, we did a different thing. And our, um, we've increased 91% on internet and we've actually pivoted. So our sales are up 56% from last year. Mm -hmm. And 
it's interesting because similar to you, I started this dive in, take courses, learn what to do, figure it. And I did kind of a very aggressive approach and I'm really seeing the results. What I'm struggling is finding out who's looking at the COVID consumer for Christmas. So I'm trying to look at the time frames. For sure. So um, I have my email at the end of this because um, post media we work, um, we have a research company sort of in house and we work with Borel Associates, which is a very large US research company, but they do do Canadian research. So we're in the midst of kind of doing that right now, um, oh. kind of seeing where these trends are going. But I do have some stuff right now that I could send over to the group, um, just kind of talking about people's habits. Like, for example, a lot of people for the first time did online shopping ever. Like they were not online shoppers. They were not ordering their groceries. And the majority of those people said that they're going to keep doing it because okay. it's easy and it's convenient. So I'll send you those exact numbers. So you can have them. And then, Thank um, you. like I said, my email's here. So please connect. And when we kind of get this new, um, info coming out, cause we are working on it because especially with the holidays, like people are preparing for that now and uh it's good to know though so definitely but for this presentation um i'm kind of just talking about how these new habits are built so you know the research is kind of talking about where they started but i can definitely get some stuff over to you about what's coming up in the next few months okay great just send me an email or maybe i'll send something out to everyone and we can connect that way Okay, great. So um, the next thing to do is if you are kind of in this place where you're not sure, it might be a good time to ask an external marketing expert for that reason that they're doing the research. They have a lot of other clients that are going through this and they may be able to help you with a few things as well. You never want your messaging to not be on appropriate or on par. Like this is a very sensitive time. So if you feel like you're not in that place where you can maybe do this on your own, reach out and it doesn't have to be with everything. I find sometimes people think when they work with an external marketing expert, it's all or nothing. A lot of times maybe you can just alleviate some of the things that you're not sure of and you're not, and then focus on some other things. So, you know, a few of our clients, they kind of say to us like, Facebook is one of those things that we can't wrap our head around, but they still kind of do their own posting, but we fall, we manage their ads or they do their SEM and we do their SEO. So maybe you're not in a place where you can invest all your dollars in external marketing, but if you kind of are really struggling, it might be a time to do it before it's too late because they're experts and you know, they might be able to help guide you. But like I said, everyone's, um, situation is different and it might not be an option. So there's lots of things that you can do personally to kind of make sure that your messaging and creative is, um, you know, essential, it's on par and it makes sense. Um, so we're going to talk about creative. I think this is a really, really important topic. And a lot of people kind of don't focus on this. They kind of are, don't put a lot of effort into their creative and it's such an important part of, of what you do. So, um, a recent Nielsen study actually showed that the number one factor in converting online sales was creative by 47%. That's half, you know what I mean? So people really look at, you know, good creative or communicative, it's clear, it's concise, and that really does bring them in. Is it, there's their storytelling, are your images clear? Is there a good layout? The amount of times I've been scrolling on social media, I see an ad that's kind of pixelated or there's a spelling mistake and I know it seems kind of like oh what's the big deal but for a consumer that's kind of a red flag or it's not as enticing so it's really important that your creative kind of makes sense and that it's um, appropriate for what's going on um, a lot of people you know they they don't do what's appropriate and they just kind of do what they've been doing but things are very very different you need that to match so um Something that you need to do before you start doing your creative is knowing who your customer profile is. And for a lot of people that's changed in the last few months, their customers have changed. So um, if you guys don't know what that is, there's something called a buyer persona. Um, you can Google it, say buyer persona, how to build a buyer persona, examples of buyer personas. And this will really, really help you decide what your creative looks like. Um, we had a real estate company and they have three different cu um, customers, right? They have the buyer, the seller, and the investor. And those three people are different and they require different advertising because they're not looking for the same thing. 
you know, like a buyer's looking, like maybe is the market good? The investor's looking, like what's for sale? Do I have a chance to move cash and take advantage? Um, you know, sellers are saying like, what's the uncertainty? Will I be able to sell my house? So these are three really different buyer personas. If you don't understand them and you advertise them to all the same, you're gonna miss out on two out of three of your buyer persona. So take that time, especially right now as consumers are shifting a bit, know how to talk to them, know what they're looking for. I apologize if you guys can see my cat. She's crawling all over my chair right now. <laughs> Anyways, um, so creative is really, really important. And um, a company that did it great, which I'm going to send this out just so you guys can watch it. I just don't want to um, waste too much time. And I want you guys to ask questions is Heineken. They did a back to bars ad. And basically the ad is a bunch of people going back to a bar. And instead of hugging, they're elbow bumping and they're wearing masks and they're not cheersing, but they're distancing cheersing. And the reason this ad is so great is that it's not insensitive. Imagine if Heineken put out an ad with a crowded bar. A lot of people would look at it and say, like, how did they do that? That's so incredible. So you got to make sure, A, that it kind of matches the current environment and um, be that like it's appropriate. So Instagram's a great way. They had a lot of stickers and tags that you could use to show that you're compliant and you're safe and you're participating in this new way of life, which is, you know, uh, safer um, and kind of more distant lifestyle. So a lot of companies, they use the stay home sticker. So like I said, that um, ice cream shop, stay home we'll come to you or stay home, we deliver, or it might just be, you know, um, stay home, but when you're ready, we're here. So there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, so something that I think is super important right now is to create a promotional campaign. Um, like I said, the we're open and we're compliant is great, but right now people are still kind of holding on to their spending dollars. Um, they don't feel safe. They're not really sure what to do. They don't know where they should be spending their money. But at the same time, people do kind of need to get out and enjoy themselves. And especially it's summertime and we've kind of been at this for six months and people are getting to that point where, you know what, I deserve a vacation, but they can't get on a plane. So um, a hotel in Calgary did something called a staycation. And what they did is they did these amazing promotional bundles, which included breakfast, a room, um, spa, kind of bundles that people would use that were at a discounted rate. So these hotels were saying, we're not filling our rooms with outsiders like outside traffic, outside visitors, tourists. How are we going to make money? How are we going to get people through the door? And they said, people aren't going anywhere. Why don't they come here? You know, a lot of people have kids. A lot of people are in a full house and they just might not want to get away for the weekend. And so this is a really, really great promotion that they did. Um, you know, they got to be innovative, especially with the hospitality industry. It, it kind of took a really big hit. So for our people in Alberta to have a staycation, it was a very unique experience and it was a unique promotion that really drove traffic. So think about unique ways that you can do this, unique ways that you can promote something. Um, I have a list of promotions that you guys can kind of maybe keep in mind, um, you know, a chance to win, a subscription model such as the ice cream uh, place, a member's discount, a refer a friend, a loyalty program, a try it for free, um, treasure hunting, scratch off tickets for discounts, sweet steaks, buy one, get one, or clearance sale. Um, I've seen a lot of clearance sales. My um, packages at my door are proof of that. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have been bored in online shopping as well. So there's a lot of deals going on, but you got to make sure that you stand out. And those promotions are really going to start to fill the funnel for you as um, things move on. Can, like I, just, I, said, but, yep, can yeah. I just ask, what is treasure hunting scratch off tickets? Is that a physical ticket or is that a multimedia ticket? So it is a, it could be either. So there's ways to actually build these online where they would get it like in their inbox and they can kind of take their mouse and scratch off. Like I think really? shoppers does it a lot with text messages. I get text messages from shoppers where you get an optimum promotion. So I open a little um, link and it goes to a landing page and I just kind of take my mouse and I do this and a little um, promotion comes out. So 20 times the points or spend $30 and get, yeah. So um, it's a really unique way, right? To get people involved. And um, I get my shoppers, when it comes about every, um, about once a week, actually. So every week I either get a promotion or a deal. And um, it seems like I said, very personal, right? Cause I'm getting it to my phone and Hey Dahlia, this is your promotion for the weekend. So it's a, it's a fun way to kind of um, do that. And then you're also not kind of discounting everyone um, at the same rate, right? Like you could do 10%, 20, 30 and have it by chance. So um, there's some ways to do that online. If anyone's curious, just like I said, send me an email and can kind of connect you with some online resources. 
All right. Um, so the next is get online. If you are not online, you need to get online yesterday. Um, as things shifted and brick and mortar stores closed down, a lot of consumers who were big internet shoppers started to because of the coronavirus. 29% um, Canadian consumers say they are making online purchases when they wouldn't have before. So this is proof that we have this kind of shifting um, sort of trend happening where people who wouldn't normally shop online or do those things online, like my parents, we just got my dad a cell phone and you know what I mean? And so to see someone like my dad say, let's shop online instead, or let's do this online. Um, you know, we set up his online banking. Like we're seeing all of these people kind of who maybe even didn't do this before. And I think a lot of people think, you know, online is a younger generation, but with this, it kind of pushed everyone online because we didn't really have a choice. So 29% of Canadian consumers are making online purchases that they would have shopped in store and nearly one out of 10 Canadian consumers who made an online purchase in March said they would continue to do that for the rest of the year. So e-commerce website is obviously one way to do this. Um, a lot of people understand that e-commerce is expensive and it might not be feasible for you or might not make sense if you're not offering enough product, but there are ways to be online without having a full e-commerce website. One is adding a Shopify plugin. So you would just kind of have a plugin and maybe um, offer those high items that you know you have a big margin on and offer those online, right? Like you know you have a big margin on them, you know they're not expensive to ship and just offer maybe those through a Shopify widget. You can have a program where you add a pop-in and they just kind of call an order and then you send it. So there's a lot of different ways to do it if you can't afford a full e-commerce website. And um, last but not least is uh, look for help. Um, there's a lot of grants going on right now. Um, throughout the crisis, the government of Canada offered a lot of businesses, many programs to help. Um, but as Canada reopens, Post Media is also doing this because we understand that this is really tough times and a lot of businesses are gonna need support to survive. And um, we're very excited to do that and offer that. So, um, Post Media does have 125 brands, but we are offering them to people outside of those brands because in Brampton, we don't have a legacy brand, but there's no restrictions to that. You can kind of be anywhere in Canada. So if you're looking to apply, um, you can go to www.postmediasolution.com slash grant. Um, there are two types of grants going on. Uh, we are kind of focusing on sectors that were hit. So like tourism, hospitality, restaurants, but it's not secluded to those. We've had a lot of people from a lot of different industries um, tell us their stories stories, explain what they're trying to do, um, where they're trying to go and kind of how this has hurt them and how we can help. So there's two programs, um, one where it's just grant dollars and a match program as well. So definitely check that out. There's more information at this URL. And um, if it makes sense for you, definitely apply and um, even send me a heads up so I can kind of let our sales rep know that I talked to this person, they applied and I really want them to kind of get the grant to move forward. So apply, send me a note and we'll kind of get that process going. That's a, um, that's, that's a great outreach opportunity. Uh, that's amazing. Absolutely. And it just got extended. So we asked some time and um, I think it could really help some, some places right now. So uh, I have, I have two more questions. Yeah, um, well, this is my next slide. So let's. Uh, <laughs> okay. I want to dive in because I'm telling you, it's a great presentation. I really appreciate how current you are. Um, so one of my question, one of my first questions is, is when you create an, uh, we have, so I sell essential oils. We have over 650 different essential oils. I'm not going to put all of them online. The question yeah. that we come with is at what point, like how many products on a website is too much? Is there a number like above a hundred, below a hundred? I know we've categorized it in different categories, but it can also be overwhelming. And I'm trying to also drive them back to the brick and mortar because one of our most successful programs has been free delivery and we'll, will continue free delivery forever. So um, I would say there isn't a, a cap for products. And the reason why, the more products you have online will actually help your website show up higher on Google. Really? Yes. So the reason for that is, is Google wants to provide relevant, important information, right? So let's say I'm looking up a flavor that's not on there. Google's not going to show me your website, right? Like, let's say I really want Clementine essential oils and that's not on your website. Your website's not going to come up for me because Google's saying she doesn't really even have this. So why oh. are we going to show it to this person searching for it? So um, I actually would say the more, the better. Um, 
but don't feel like they need to go put everything up right now. No, 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 no. I get what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. My second question. Well, thank you. That's really important. Absolutely. Second question. Um, so prior to COVID, there was usually marketing people would tell you, you send your emails on Thursdays. Um, because Fridays people don't answer their emails. Mondays is not a good time. There's a certain time. So now what is the COVID consumer getting their emails? Um, so I would say emails would probably stay similar. When you're looking at social media, that's where the big change has been because so many people are consuming social media at a much higher rate than they were. So I would stick to those email trends because I think most people's hours, if they are working, are the same. And if they're not, you're kind of still hitting them during um, high phone, I would say, time or computer time. So um, there's always pros and cons to doing it in those high hours that are recommended because you have to understand this information is widely spread online. And so a lot of places send out their emails at the same time. Yeah. I personally, myself, I look at emails in the morning. You know what I mean? Like I look at my work email, I look at my personal email, and then I check it maybe around my lunchtime. So there's different behaviors, but there hasn't been anything about email that's coming out. It's been more about social media because okay. that has changed extremely because people's usage has doubled, if not tripled. All right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And if any other questions come up, um, I have my email here on the next slide. So feel free to reach out. Um, I'm just going to go through three things. And then, like I said, if anyone else has a question, um, feel free. But you can apply for the marketing grant at Post Media. You could subscribe to our newsletter or you can request a free digital audit. So this free digital audit basically tells you how well you're doing online right now. Um, it costs nothing. I promise this isn't a scheme to, we're going to send you a bill later. It's just to kind of let you know how you're doing online in three different categories, which is your website, your search, and your social. So it's totally free. And you can even compare yourself to your competitors because a lot of people, you know, they see their competitors ahead of them on, when someone searches on Google and they're wondering why. Well, we can kind of give you more insight on that. So if you're interested in any of those things, just send me an email. We can kind of go through it or if there's anything else that comes up and um, I'd be more than happy to connect. Um, and uh, that's sort of my whole spiel for today. <laughs> um, if anyone else has any questions, um, I'm all ears. Question for you, Dahlia. You'd mentioned, um, you know, social media sort of, you know, doubling, tripling in this time. And I know, especially those first uh, few weeks of quarantine, you know, when you get that screen report at the end of the week when uh, yeah. uh, Apple tells you that you your screen time's up by 87% this yeah. week um, and you felt really judged. Um, have, is, has there been an increase in one social media platform over another? Um, and should, I guess, should, you know, as a business, should our investment reflect that? Um, your investment should reflect where your audience is. Hmm. So um, there has been increase across the board. Like things like Twitter started gaining a little bit because um, Twitter has a lot of news on it. People go to Twitter for their news, believe it or not. So that kind of had a, a larger spike than the other, you know, social media. But you really want to focus on your audience. So like, is your audience on Facebook? Are they on Instagram? And there's ways to kind of figure that out too. So there's some tags such as the Google um, tag that, or the Facebook tag that you can put on your website. So you can kind of find out who your audience is through your Google Analytics and where they're coming from. And are they coming from Facebook versus Instagram? And a great way to do that is even to run a Facebook Instagram campaign where in, or Facebook kind of does it for you. They say, we're going to put some here. We're going to put some on Facebook, some on Instagram. And you can kind of see who's converting and where they're from. So then in the future, you can say, we had success with, you know, um, women the ages 25 to 30 coming from Instagram. Let's put our dollars there. But in general, it's kind of spiked across the board. You really want to invest where your audience is and not where the, because like, let's say Instagram spiked, but that's not who your people are. You're kind of putting dollars somewhere that you're not going to see a return. Gotcha. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. And if anyone's B2B, LinkedIn's been coming out with some really cool new advertising opportunities. So definitely look into that. Um, we're just in beta for it now, so it's not something we offer, but it's definitely something you could do um, on your own or with an external marketing company. But it's really, really cool for B2B to kind of um, use their new features that are coming out. I, I had a question. Yeah. Um, you know, Facebook, Instagram seem to be you know, kind of the, sort of the, the go-tos. Mm -hmm. I have to believe lots of companies are also using things like TikTok, Snapchat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, 
as, as a company with limited time and effort, how do you decide which platforms to invest in? Um, so what's great about Facebook and Instagram is it's kind of a two for one. So if you're kind of doing the work to post on one, you can automatically have it post to the other, which is really, really great. Um, I would say if you have like just a very young audience, that's when you should start looking towards something like TikTok or Snapchat. But if you're looking to hit the majority of masses, I would use Facebook and Instagram. That's where the majority of people are. And like I said, you have kind of a younger generation on Instagram with an older generation on Facebook, and you can kind of do both in one. So if you post right. a story, to uh, Instagram, you could go right on Facebook. Or if you post something to Facebook or do ads through Facebook, Facebook will optimize it for you. And let's say I'm someone that Facebook recognizes as your target market. They'll show me the ad on Instagram because that's where I am, but I right. fit who you're trying to target. So I would definitely kind of stick in that area unless you have a very, you know, specific audience or like, for example, I'm working with a company that's, um, that does a festival, a music festival, and they're doing it online, we use Spotify ads because it kind of makes more sense, right? We're looking right. for people who are into music and we could target them based on their genre and all that. But if you're kind of um, marketing to masses, a, a very large kind of like, let's say 20 to 65 female males, Facebook and Instagram kind of does both for you. And um, it's kind of taboo to say that, but I'm going to say that to you guys that you should <laughs> probably sit with those two. And, um, and something that, um, I think a lot of businesses don't use that they should is Instagram stories. Um, they're free. They could be very creative. They are, like I said, I know they go away after 24 hours, but the majority of people are not doing this anymore. They're doing this. So they're not scrolling through their feed anymore. They're scrolling clicking through their stories. That's been a huge kind of shift in Instagram. So if you have an Instagram and you're not doing stories, definitely do it. Like I said, it's low cost. It's basically free and um, you can advertise, but if you don't have those dollars, at least you're getting up there where people's eyeballs are. Um, can I ask you a question regarding LinkedIn? Um, yeah. Before uh, COVID, I was really, I, I still am successful on LinkedIn, but I never spent a dollar on advertising and yet we yield about a hundred grand off of LinkedIn and referrals and customer base. Um, so I have a group there, but I've noticed the buyer on LinkedIn has changed, even though they're still my target market. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in the process right now of pivoting my marketing and reaching out back to LinkedIn because I'm noticing they're coming up with advertising and they're coming up with a more target. And it's almost like the dust is settling and businesses are trying to figure out how to move. Is that that is still a separate market, correct? Like the person on LinkedIn, even though they have a Facebook account and an Instagram account, <laughs> there's still a different buyer when they're in work. Absolutely. And if you're doing B2B, LinkedIn's the place to be. A lot of um, B2B advertisements on Facebook and Instagram usually don't yield high results. Um, yeah. So I would do LinkedIn and um, something to just keep an eye out for. So a lot of stats will start coming out and this is something Facebook did and it really seems like LinkedIn's following in their footsteps is before if you would go on Facebook, it was chronological. And now it's kind of giving you stuff that makes sense to you. So when you post as a business, you're not getting as many eyeballs on things as you used to. So as a business, if you post, it's about under 10% of your followers that are seeing your posts. So if you have, you know, 3,000 followers, you're not really getting much of a reach if you're only getting less than 10% of those followers. And yeah. the reason they did that is to push people into advertising. Sure. So you want to just make sure, like, if you start to see a drop in your organic kind of um, level yeah, of traffic uh, and revenue, uh, that's definitely going to be Drastically. We do, I do, um, I have a group on LinkedIn called the Olfactive Group, mm -hmm. and we have some of the best researchers and everybody around the world that quantifies the connection between scent and mental health. It's a massive trend, but it, I have this and we have probably over, I think, 4,500 members. And we used to get on a daily basis maybe one request, two requests, because I still monitor who comes in because there's no advertising on this group. I'm actually very due diligent and I kick a lot of companies off who use it. It's only for research mm -hmm. and it's only to help consumers. But ever since COVID, our numbers have dropped drastically where we may get two or three requests to join the group a month. And I couldn't understand 
what happened? <laughs> I'm more relevant than ever <laughs> in my world. And how come no one's, so that's interesting. So it's less than 10%. So well, that's Facebook, but what LinkedIn looks like they're doing is following that footstep where okay. they're showing those things less. So you're kind of forced to advertise so that your message okay. will be in front of eyeballs. So um, based on just kind of the sort of advertising opportunities that they're coming out with, it really looks like that's kind of the direction they're going in. Um, so that's not a surprise to me at all that that's happening because the second they said that they were kind of modeling their advertising off Facebook, that was kind of like a okay, we're probably going to see a drop in organic traffic okay. as businesses because then they kind of force you to advertise. It's very sneaky, but... Um. Yeah, because this is... And it's they've hit me drastically because I have gone back and forth. I've tried the gold membership. I've been playing around. I've been putting up different stories. I have different people asking. And we've been playing around what happened. What happened to LinkedIn? We were yeah. doing really well. And we weren't really spending any money. In fact, we weren't. But we were offering great contact. And the contact... The, the connections we were making were, were really good quality. We weren't going through a hundred people to find one. It was, it was wonderful. And then in the last three to six months, it's all stopped. And I'm thinking, gee, I wonder why now you're telling me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I have to like, buy ads. Okay. Just like disclaimer, that's not like a fact, but like no, that's I hear just you. my um, assumption based on their, they've come up with a lot of advertising the last few months, a lot. So, okay. you know, how did they force people into that bubble? They say no one's seeing your stuff unless okay. you do it this way. Got it. Thank you. Absolutely. No problem. I have a question about, um, you were talking about um, Instagram and Facebook. I'm wondering how Pinterest, do you think that fits into um, a social strategy for a business, a local business, if you think that would be a good strategy as well for people to consider? Absolutely. And when it comes to Pinterest, um, it's very really important that you integrate your advertisements to look like a Pinterest um, post. So we see a lot of people, they try and go on TikTok or Pinterest, but it looks like an ad. And with something like that, it needs to be very integrated. So if you're a business that offers like, um, let's say you um, own a bakery, you could do a how to make blueberry muffins and you know how the nice pictures and stuff like that. Cause people use Pinterest for a lot of things, decorating, cooking, fashion. And so if it's not integrated correctly, you're probably going to miss out and be spending dollars and not really getting any results. So Pinterest is amazing if you can do it right, if you can integrate it correctly, but if you can't, you might not want to spend your dollars there. Um, but there's a lot of research coming out about how Pinterest when it's integrated can really yield very good results. So definitely include it in your social strategy but it kind of matters what you're doing on Pinterest because you know um, let's say you're detailing cars it might not be as successful as like a boutique a fashion boutique or a bakery but it's still good to kind of um, use it especially when you can just kind of as well post either integrated posts that are just organic and then boost those posts or do an ad that's integrated and really kind of yield the results from that great thank you for clarifying yeah absolutely Hi, um, this is Cassidy White here. Um, I'm a student at University of Guelph going into my last year, um, but I just had a question. I know earlier you were talking about the messaging at the beginning of COVID, how it was mm -hmm. very like, we're here for you kind of centered. I was just wondering if, if and when there's a second wave, do you think that businesses or marketing should still stay to that same messaging as things get more serious or do you think there'll be a shift um, in that messaging? I think, um there will be a slight shift, but that messaging will still be very present. Um, if let's say there is a second wave and we go back in, um, I think what's going to happen is you're going to see a lot of people referring to what they've done instead of what they're going to do. So I think the messaging will say the same, but I'll kind of say during the first wave, this is what we did to make sure our people were safe with more of like a kind of a proof rather than a, um, a promise. So I really do think that messaging should and will stick around. Um, but the thing is, it's got to be careful and it can't be overwhelming because like I said, you see it everywhere and if there's no kind of um, third, what we have to offer, what we're going to do for you people, it just gets lost. Like, you know what I mean? So I definitely think business will kind of go from a, a proving what they did instead of a promising what they're going to do, but it's still going to kind of be around um, if like, you know, praying there's not, if there is a second wave, I do think though that um, will happen. 
I hope that answered your question. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's okay. perfect. Thank you. And that was a good question, Cassidy. I was trying to think of how to word it the same way, because I think we've seen a change in the messaging over the last, um, you know, however many months it's yeah. been, 837. I'm not sure. It's been a long time, <laughs> it feels like. Um, but, but it's gone from, okay, yep, here's what we're doing. And then it's, you know, now there's the, the kind of, okay, we're keeping you safe, but, you know, there's almost the, we're keeping you safe and don't forget to come back and still shop here. Um, Absolutely. And um, I was thinking of, you know, as you were talking, there's a couple of things that, uh, you know, just when you talk about the ice cream store, being able to, you know, do delivery and that, which genius, by the way, but uh, <laughs> even um, Uber Eats now, um, which my husband discovered, he doesn't drive. So he's discovered that, you know, through Uber Eats, they can actually go and do your grocery shopping for you. And it's significantly faster than doing one of like the click and collect or any yeah. of that. It's um, an hour and a half after he uh, orders his groceries, they're at our door. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it'll be interesting, I think, to see sort of, I get like how that, what, what the next phase of messaging is going to be. And I think we've seen it with businesses as well, where there was the immediate shutdown and then there was the next phase, which was the, okay, how are we going to sort of make it work during mm -hmm. this time to get through? Now we're in sort of, okay, we, we need business back again. And it's, um, it's interesting to see what comes next. There was a, a tweet and it's obviously a joke, but it said like original COVID messaging, like we're here for you. And then like COVID messaging now, like you might as well get it at Burger King. Like it's a very different where they're kind of, and like obviously do not have your messaging say that, but it's right. a joke, but it's also kind of reflecting what we, how we saw this, like we're here yeah. for you, we're here for you. And now they're like, we have a deal, come in. Cause you know, um, also consumers are kind of tired of the COVID um, constant kind of messaging. So I think, um, it's important to keep it because you do want your customers to feel safe, but I think kind of proving what you've done in the past or kind of showing your new kind of, like you said, like Uber Eats is being at food is more essential than constantly kind of giving out these kind of, I don't want to say empty promises, but these kind of overused messages. Dahlia, I had a question. Are there any nuances, um, you know, you've talked a lot about B2B and B2C marketing solutions. What about for nonprofit sector um, where, where, you know, messaging, digital messaging might be a little different. Um, any thoughts on that? Are there, are there, you know, do these basic principles you've talked about apply regardless of, of what marketing you're doing? Or do you think there's some nuances there for, for nonprofit or um, more service-based organizations? Yeah, um, I do think it holds um, pretty similar, but with one for profit, um, something that's really like great for them that we always recommend is um, storytelling. Um, you know, like we work very closely with United Way and just kind of seeing like doing it now when you have these like really great stories or these great people in your organization, like it's really great to use those voices. And I think a lot of companies are really scared of video because they think to use a video ad or to post a video, they need like this like very expensive production, but you don't, you know, a camera is on your phone, like this thing right here can do it all. So you can really just kind of use that and tell stories, um, share experiences, introduce people on your board, you know, like especially a lot of non for profits are community oriented. They want to see those people, you know what I mean? Like they're usually people that are in the community and um, are recognizable faces. So, really, I think that's one thing that I would recommend for non for profits more is really use video to share your story and storytell because um, emotions is really what what causes people mm -hmm. to take action. So, um, all this really still stands. And I know maybe the promotion is not as much, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I don't know how they would do a promotion unless they're maybe giving something away if people donate or that. But I think video is one thing that I didn't mention here, but not for profits. I always say to them, like, you have the story, you just got to find a way to tell it. Great. Perfect. Um, I have a question. I think one thing that I've seen a little bit, so I work for an accounting firm, so not a product, but a service, but a lot of um, the questions or the material that we have to communicate is changing every day. The government's changing, you know, programs that's had in place, extensions, deadlines, criteria, eligibility, whatnot. And a lot of it's just basically sharing non-original content. So, you know, we can't keep up and every day generate original content to share a lot of the information. So, <clears throat> you know, posting links to CRA saying, you know, tax deadline now, September 30th, and hopefully that's it. But, um, you know, it is still an effect, is that still an effective way, I guess, to 
to market by just sharing something that's not original but useful still? Absolutely. I think um, that still shows that you are providing information to them. If it's coming from you, it's better because it shows you're more of a thought leader, but you can't decide what CRA is going to do. So you kind of have to share what they're doing. So absolutely, because if I know that you're constantly updating me, I have a reason to follow you. I have a reason to kind of connect with you because I know if I need my updates, you're going to post them. And I think a lot of people think you're kind of sending them somewhere else, but you could have a call to action that is personal. So if you're not adding that personal call to action, I think that's where you can maybe make a change that can kind of help. So like um, if you're still doing this and you need help, like this has been extended, post the article, but post an email, they could reach out to you. Or you know what I mean? Like find a way to have the call to action be towards your company. So they don't just click on the link and go to CRA that they're actually like, oh, I have to do this. I'm going to email this person or give them a call or, but absolutely do that. Um, Information is important and um, it's a great way to kind of keep yourself relevant. Well, thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions for Dahlia? And if something comes up later, like I said, just shoot me an email. We could definitely um, um, chat. If there's something that you want more clarification on, um, send me an email. I can, I can make sure to get you some more um, kind of stats or reporting and not just kind of me blabbering. So definitely reach out and um, I can kind of help you out a little bit further. Awesome. So I want to say thank you. Uh, I think that Tracy is right. This was exceptionally relevant uh, information. And having talked to you, um, you know, a little bit senior expert series, this um, is about this much of the information uh, and expertise that Dahlia has to offer. So <laughs> get in touch. You've got her email address there. Um, and yeah, keep asking the questions because, um, you know, I think that the messaging that we're putting out there is important and I've taken a few notes myself here to make sure that um, the Board of Trade is doing all of those things as well. So um, that's great. I just want to sort of throw it open. Um, I, I do want to talk about some um, upcoming events uh, and initiatives that we have, but if anyone else has input or comments that they want to give. Tracy, I just noticed you turn your screen back on. I want you to talk about your Good Vibes Kit. Um, oh, yeah, you thank can. you. Yeah. Yeah, so um, this is an incentive that started out in my kitchen. I actually did a, an organic video um, expressing my story. Um, so when COVID hit, it impacted me twofold, economically huge. But a lot of people don't know, I am a volunteer for Meals on Wheels and I've been driving for Brampton Meals on Wheels for about 15 years. And when we got out in the cars to go out, we didn't have PPE equipment because we were not classified an essential service, which terrified the people who were receiving the food from us, which compounded the pain 10 times because now we're on the front lines helping these people out. We can't talk to them. We can't give them their food and you can actually walk away. So there were days I was just like, oh, I couldn't cope. I had such a hard time. Then half of our drivers are seniors and they had to be pulled from the front line. So the younger drivers like myself, we were doing four and five shifts as a business owner. I can't sit doing nothing. So I just dove into volunteering and I realized we had to do something. So I created this wellness kit which is a campaign, instead of giving flowers, uh, instead of sending um, uh, fruit baskets, the idea is, is you send good vibes and the wellness kit is created by all Canadians. Every product that is inside is a Canadian product and it's targeting mental health, which is my specialty. And it's using um, things like smell, there's lavender essential oil in the kit with a small diffuser. There's a, a custom fragrance called uh, Blue, which was done with the University of Waterloo that talks about creating trust when you diffuse it in a space. There's a micro cloth that you add some of our hand sanitizers that Christy's son is actually going to do a commercial for me because he loves them so much. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they were designed for children and that was the reason why it doesn't surprise me. They have peppermint oil and aloe and there they are. <laughs> Thank you, Christy. It sits right here on my desk. <laughs> yeah. So I designed it because of seniors. They can't use the pure alcohol on their hands. 
And so we did a very mild, gentle formula. And then there's an artist, Amanda Busby, who is from Brampton, who created the woman that is called COVID Blues. What does it look like? And we gave a postcard. And then we shipped this box. Any, oh, and the artist behind the packaging is from Montreal. The co-packer is from BC. The printing company that helped me with the labels and so far is here in Brampton. So my bandwidth of actually helping other companies and businesses goes grand with this one across the country. And so we're starting now to pivot and send these boxes out to people. And we've just shipped three to the US. So I'm really excited because our messaging is getting out. Um, and we've picked up two corporate accounts, um, one with um, a CUPE organization, as well as we're trying to work with Aeroplan or one of the air airlines of a reward system. So this is something where we give back because for every hundred hand sanitizers, a thousand hand sanitizers, we give a hundred hand sanitizers to the Brampton board, I mean to Meals on Wheels. And we really kind of are trying to figure out how do we balance charity, help businesses by making money so I can keep buying product for them and also sending love and affection. Anyway, this is something that I'm really proud of. Um, it's actually a pivoting point for us and this is where our campaign is. So thank you for letting me do my spiel. <laughs> I really Tracy, appreciate it. What, what's, what's for a corporate customer, what's your cost per kit? Um, we sell them for $50 and then we have a discount if you buy a minimal of 50 we give you 20% off. If it is in Brampton, we do free delivery um, and we'll ship it. There's a, we'll work out and negotiate a shipping price because we're partnering with UPS. Right. Okay, great. Good to know. Yeah, and I think the mental health component uh, is huge. And that's why, you know, I want Tracy, I wanted you to talk about it. I've, so I'm not even kidding. My son will only use Tracy's hand sanitizer. He refuses <laughs> to use anything else. I made my own, you know, before Tracy came out with hers. And he's like, no, I'm only using Tracy's. So <laughs> um, Thank you. I've had a few kids. I, we've targeted private schools in Montessori. So if anybody needs hand sanitizers, we sell them by the case. And we do have a discount for Board of Trade members where we give you an additional 20% off only if you're a board member. So you can contact me and we'll definitely do that. But the product is very different. It's designed for children. It is COVID approved. We have our health standards. It is an aloe peppermint uh, base formula. So it doesn't smell like the grungy alcohol. There's a lot of recalls as an FYI, as you're sending your kids back to school. There were about, I think, 42 deaths last month related to people drinking hand sanitizers. So they're cracking down now because they had a, a lax um, regulation at first when COVID hit and they were allowing companies to kind of make anything and not follow regulations. However, that is stopped. And so check for the recalls. And I've even seen it in grocery stores. Longo's had a huge recall of a massive product that was not approved um, and didn't meet the criteria. So my attitude is I'm not a big person um, who likes alcohol because we don't use it in any of our products in our formulas or our store or anything. It's never been part of our fragrances. So to have to make alcohol, I want to make sure that you're doing it properly because if you're using it for the purpose of COVID, there are science that shows that anything that doesn't meet the standards of Canada, it's not worth it. It's a waste of money, actually, to be honest. So when you sending your kids back to school, really look into the quality of the product and make sure that the uh, license on the back meets COVID standards in Canada because they're very strict here. Yeah, and that um, that back to school piece in uh, just a few weeks is a hot topic for parents of school aged kids right now. So, um, you know, when we talk about mental health and the stress, um, you know, and um, I my kids are uh, 10 and 11. And uh, right now I feel like I'm being forced to choose between their mental health and their physical health, um, you know, and just yeah. sort of decide which is at greater risk right now. And uh, yeah, YouTube, I, I, YouTube has done a wonderful job of homeschooling my children, and I'm ready for them to be back in the classroom. So yeah. they will be going uh, prepared with Tracy's hand sanitizer, that's for Well, sure. and it's really interesting you said that. My kids are not in the school system. They're older. They've graduated. 
Um, but I have a son who has, he's on the spectrum and he's older, but actually it's going to age me. I don't often say this, but Christy was my son's babysitter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> ages us all. And my son's 28. So there so you that go. Ages me quite a bit because I'm pretty <laughs> sure he's still little. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if I read the report from sick kids and that being that I'm in the mental, I focus on mental health. I got that report 100%. And I applaud the Doug Ford. I really do. I'm not a PC fan, but I applaud what he's doing because in Quebec, they're making it mandatory. You send your kids back. And if I had my son in school in this situation, there's no way I could send him. But my daughter, I'd set, I'd set her up with every thing I could get to get her into school because the mental health component on my son would have been detrimental for him. But for her, she's at, she would have been worse off staying at home than going back to school. And I think with her tenacity and her character, if I gave her, you know, one of the other tricks that moms can use is you put a drop of essential oils, tell your child it's a superpower in their face mask. And then if you use peppermint oil or lavender, they're breathing in something and you give them confidence as well as it helps with the odor from their breath, which some kids that are tactile or have um, spectrum disorder, they can't handle it. And it really means they're claustrophobic. So you can just get any essential oil, doesn't matter, but you can put a drop in the fabric. And then when they're going off to school, you can indirectly tell them this is your superpower. And if you need it at 12 o'clock or one o'clock, put a drop in and uh, we'll, or we'll refresh it when you come home or however. And it's just, these are the tricks you do when you obviously have children and all blessed mothers who are in this, I, I don't think I could handle that one. So Christy, good luck and all the other moms. You know, in fairness, I'm not really sure any of us had a choice. <laughs> Yeah, so true. it's uh, yeah. It, I mean, you do you you know do what you have to do. I'm glad that my uh, children are a little bit older uh, in this point. But I mean, the mental health component of what is happening right now, I think, is huge, and that um, you know is kind of a nice tie into why you know we've we've got the support network here. So um, I do want to throw a couple more uh, dates and pieces of information at you before uh, I let everybody go. Uh, one of the things that Dahlia mentioned uh, specifically was, you know, e-commerce and Shopify. I did want to know we do have a, a Brampton Board of Trade partner in Freightcom. They're a Bolton company. They are fantastic to work with. And Brampton Board of Trade members do get a discount uh, on their e-commerce platform and on their shipping. And they do uh, LTL, uh, which is less than truckload shipping. So whether it's, you know, Tracy, your you know, whether there's one box or a thousand boxes of your um, your Good Vibes kit that you're sending out, there's um, some great options there through Freightcom. So um, shameless plug for them, which is great. Um, our business development network. So obviously we've done a lot of our, you know, virtual events and we're trying to make them very specific to the group. So Connect Work is one of our peer-to-peer -peer network groups. Another one that we have coming up is our business development network and Paula from Bayshore. Um, is actually going to be speaking um, at that one next week, which is great. And talking a little bit about, you know, how are we finding customers right now? How are we doing business development? Because now we're in this phase of, hey, like, where are we going to go to find, you know, our next customer? And then taking the messaging that we've got today from Dahlia and saying, okay, let's, let's message to our next customers um, and clients and how are we going to find them? So that is August 20th. So, and that will be at 8 a.m. So mark that in your calendar as well. Next month, Connect Work is September 16th. Um, so make sure you've got that one done. Um, the other um, date that I wanted to get on your calendars is October 7th. Um, tentatively hold that date. And uh, I haven't even told Vanessa. Is Vanessa, it's not even in your calendar yet, but you'll probably be involved in this one. Right. Um, so, um, we so sometimes we do this to Vanessa. She just she, okay. she really she rolls with the punches. She's really good at it. <laughs> um, but Dr. Naveed Mohammed, who is the head of the William Osler uh, Health uh, System, which I the tough job right now for sure, um, will be participating in our View from the Top series. So talking a little bit about what the vision is for uh, William Osler and how he came to this role and you know what his plans are. Uh, Todd was having a conversation with him last week, and they are preparing for that first two weeks in November to really be that next uh, surge 
in cases. So, um, which, I mean, we'll see, and you know, we don't know for sure, but that's what William Osler is preparing for. So um, there's a few dates there just to keep in mind. Right. Other, oh, Christy, are yeah. you going to be posting um, a copy of Dahlia's uh, presentation and the recording of this uh, video of this uh, session? Yes, I'm going to put it on the Connect Work page on our website. Uh, and then Dahlia, thank you for that reminder, Vanessa. Dahlia, any other resources that you have, I am happy to uh, post on that page to share the information because I think there's some great stuff there. So yes, I'm going to, if you can send me a copy of your presentation and some of those other resources you spoke about, I'll put them right on the Connect Work page. That's I'll great. In this video, I did forget to hit record until about three or four minutes in um, because I didn't, I didn't want to catch all our kitty chat at the beginning and then I forgot to hit record. Um, I have it from about three to four minutes into the end. So yeah, I'm going to get that posted. Then I believe that there was a request about, oh, Tracy, yeah, you should, Tracy shared her email address there in the chat. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions, comments, insights? I really appreciate this, Christy. I can't tell you how many Zoom conferences I've been on. I've been dealing with government officials who are talking so far behind and uh, it's really great to be with a company that has pivoted quickly, is relevant and is looking at the future and looking towards the November. I have seen um, and I know the reports too from the Health Canada and the World Canada Health Organization and what they're looking at and they're anticipating November too, especially with influenza and the way we normally do. So the pivot point to me is strategic. It's mm -hmm. almost like um, it's just timing. And sometimes I get on these conferences and they're just so really, we're right in the middle of this pandemic. Why isn't anybody looking to the future or for next year? You know, what's going to happen in the spring when, you know, February hits and mental health triples, like triples, like this is something. And I, 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 in candidness, I've presented it to our mayor and he didn't have an answer. How we ha how are we handling this? How are we going to cope with it? Um, I have a daughter when it happened, we ended up in the psychiatric ward in a pandemic because she had a mental breakdown. It's, it happens to everybody and there's a lot of fragileness and people who thought they were really strong, they can't cope. There's just mm -hmm. way too much happening and there's way too much. And then if you have parents, I have friends who have parents in nursing homes that couldn't see, speak or talk. And then, you know, you've got that death component looming. Like there's just so many other things that I think as women, we, we deal with, we kind of put on our radars and then one day we kind of just collapse and we fall apart. And I think you know, we have to be more diligent of setting time to talk with each other. And, and I just, the relevancy of what you're doing is kudos. So tell your team, I really appreciate it because you're actually looking forward. And then it does, it provides us information on how to prepare. And as a business person, that's what you want. You never want to go through the COVID where you're just have 24 hours ever again. Thanks, Tracy. I appreciate that. It's, um, I, I, everyone has had their, you know, challenges over the last few months and I agree. I, I'm tired. Like I am I'm exhausted. So yeah. tired. Um, but I, I, I actually feel very validated right now and I might be a little teary. So you know, I appreciate that. And that this group is, it's, um, it, it means a lot. And, uh, yeah, I, I actually made a note to even as we were talking that I think, um, either September or October, our speaker needs to be on mental health, uh, for connect work. Uh, we've talked about mental health before, and it was, I think, one of the best sessions we've uh, ever had. And I think that it's time to bring that back. It's it's timely right now. So I've definitely made a note for that. And, and we all need a good vibes wellness kit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, all the board members, you immediately get 20% off. So Awesome. Yeah, just let me know. <laughs> yeah, perfect. All right. So... I want everyone to enjoy their last few weeks of summer and uh, yeah, we'll see what happens in September, but you've got some dates in there now. Make sure you're checking your emails from me and Dahlia. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and thank, thank you, Dahlia. Dahlia. And oh. thanks everyone for joining us. And I hope you have a really good rest of the day. Bye. Thank everybody. You. Bye. Bye everyone. Thanks everybody.